All right. Thank you. So um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I welcome you most warmly to our new Resilience Lecture Series. Uh, today is very exciting. There are many things happening. It's also Eid in Germany, and it will be uh, Eid in India uh, tomorrow. So uh, Eid Mubarak to everyone um, and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and to uh, you too and to the family. Thank you. I am very excited about this lecture series because we really have a combination between um, the owners who offer first-hand experience and insights. Uh, they share the kind of information you wouldn't normally find in history books. And I'm also particularly thrilled to have Dr. Khan um, from uh, the University of God, Göttingen. Um, and it's really funny how the world is connected, you know, born in India and Rajasthan, um, you know, <laughs> educated in Delhi, and then a fellow at the Max Planck Institute. And um, now at the University of Göttingen, he has actually written the first um, historic account of Rampur in English, and it will be published with Oxford University Press. So it's actually really a, a wonderful time that we can have the chance to discuss this and share this knowledge before the book has even come out and um, so he will be providing some background on Rampur um, which is probably not so much known and you know as a scholar it is really hard fishing for the evidence and the information especially if there's nothing available in English and um, we can then use this information that we uh, that we get from the lecture to ask questions um, because I'm really happy that we have this event and of course we will be recording it, but this will give you the chance to um, really make it into a live event. So please um, ask questions and um, we will have a, a question and answer, answer session afterwards. Uh, please use the chat function to introduce yourself, say where you come from, um, or mention your institution or your interest um, in, in Rampur. I know we have a number of Rampur experts um, tonight because we had a a really fascinating discussion on our Facebook group and you should know that the Center for Historic Houses is, has a very very active um, social media um, presence literally almost everywhere on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram um, and Twitter as well um, and we will be um, sharing some information in the chat option so that you can actually join us um, we have about 2,800 very active members on, on the Facebook group Many of them are, you know, either heritage experts, owners of historic houses or heritage enthusiasts. Now, we always do the same kind of thing. A number of you have uh, participated in all of our talk talks, which is really lovely. Thank you very much for this. Um, and so we start with a short presentation and just introduction about this center. I'll be sharing some news um, and then I'll, um, I'll choose a topic. So me this is also always a surprise because every house has a unique story and somehow once I start having a little conversation with the owners I get an idea of this could be the theme and you know I, I won't say anything yet I reveal I won't reveal it yet but the theme will be coming and then we can ask um, some questions I'll be asking some provocative questions today as well um, so don't worry but um, I think we have some strong boys here today who can handle this so um, let me go to, um, I think, you know, share slideshow so that you're able to see um, better. So the Center for Historic Houses is a very new institution. It was set up by me um, at Jindal University last year. And uh, it is the first institution in India to be um, a, uh, to do what lobby work for the privately owned, the family owned um, historic houses of India. But we also work with heritage experts and the related industries and with the public and the government. So partnerships, um, institutional partnerships, um, academic partnerships and partnerships with the owners of historic houses are uh, very important for us. We have a new initiative today, which I'll be announcing um, uh, today for the first time. It's heirloom stories. You know, we work very, uh, very closely with social media and especially now during the pandemic, it's a wonderful opportunity to get in touch and to stay in touch with friends and, and family. Uh, so basically it's the idea, and maybe we can also ask the Nawab to share um, his in, <laughs> insight into his favorite piece that um, was handed down from generation to generation. And it doesn't have to be something um, valuable. I just quickly tell you my story. Um, I met a wonderful woman in Kronberg. She was uh, married to the uh, uh, Chancellor of the Bank of um, um, uh, Germany. And um, she was 
the kind of person that makes you feel really welcome and warm. She had great social skills. But at the same time, she was running the home um, as a tight ship. It was so professional. I had never seen anything like this. Uh, all the meals were prepared in, in, the week in advance. Uh, nothing was left to chance. Um, and she was simply so accomplished and professional at everything she was doing. So on paper, she was a housewife. But in reality, she was a manager an artist, um, a decorative artist, a designer, um, a chef, everything. I was really amazed. Um, so she told me the story, her name is Maria Theresia, of her great grandfather who um, was living in, 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 in Bonn and he was riding the horse all the way to Paris to the fair. Um, uh, he was a businessman and a merchant um, to uh, find um, good things to sell but he had just been recently married and his young bride was waiting for him to return, you know, every day. And he was thinking of her as well. And he, he bought her a wonderful shawl made out of precious silk neon with some tassels and embroidery. And, in the, and, and she was then waiting and she could hear the horse. He came back and he had this wonderful present for her. And actually I have a piece of this shawl. The silk has de decayed but um, the um, embroidery and the tassels still remain. And I think this is the symbolism of heritage. Um, Maria Theresia, she made it into some beautiful angels um, um, and she, 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 she made the face out of wax. It, it was such a beautiful sculpture, beautiful gowns, and she used this embroidery um, um, as, as an embellishment. And I think if we take this um, for heritage, this is a beautiful story. We take something old, we tell the story, we keep it alive, by turning it into something new. And I think this is also what we are trying to do with the Center for Historic Houses. So if you have any piece, anything like this, and you have a story to tell, just a short story, maybe just a paragraph or so, please share it with you. Use the hashtag heirloom stories um, and we will actually select the best and share it on our webpage. This is a new initiative we are planning um, in September. This is Alex Alexandre de Vaubuy. Um, he owns one of the most beautiful um, castles in Europe, uh, the Vaux le Vicomte. And uh, we are inviting owners of historic houses in India and in Europe for the first time to share best practice and to share some business ideas that go beyond tourism, especially uh, during the time of the pandemic. And um, we will also invite some um, you know, heritage managers from the leading institutions in, in Europe and in India. So I'll in invite all the owners to participate in this or heritage managers. <laughs> So these were the four um, uh, past resilient stories. Uh, we had Bhavnagar, the uh, princess of Bhavnagar, uh, uh, who had um, started a heritage initiative and is doing some really important um, uh, heritage advocacy work, working also with children, promoting heritage in the region, reaching out to other owners. We had Amanat who has an incredibly ambitious plan and he has done such incredible work of building new additions to existing historic buildings. And I think he can be an example uh, to many people all over the world, especially as far as the um, Venice Charter is concerned, that basically suggests that in the moment you have a new addition, it has to be different from the old. He's actually not doing that. And it's still a wonderful, very subtle way, not a kind of tacky Walt Disney version. And I think uh, we can all learn from him. In, here we had uh, Fort Dunlod and also the living heritage in the form of horses. And today I'm also really excited <laughs> about Rampo because you know that I'm a dog lover. Um, and uh, the, the, the Rampo hound is a beautiful dog uh, that was actually bred by one of the Nawabs in the 19th century. And perhaps we can have a, a little more insights about this. And then our last story was particularly exciting and very close close to my heart because this was a young a social entrepreneur coming from uh, the erstwhile family um, uh, in Odisha and she uh, basically started a boutique hotel out of her, um, you know, the, the, the palace, the family owned palace and she combines this with um, very innovative social impact um, ideas. Um, so these were the kind of stories in a nutshell in the previous um, ones. Now, Rampur is not so well known, but it has the most fascinating history. So we will be talking about uh, the most famous building in Rampur, which you can see here, Hamid Manzil Palace. And whenever I show this image to my students and I ask them, how old is it? When was it built? They think, oh, this is really old. 
this is a Mughal structure, 17th century or so. And then I say, wrong, I got you there. No, 1904, early 20th century. And if you look at it, it has so many features that kind of, uh, it has the Chabak, which is Islamic. You know? It has um, European elements, it has the Chhatris, and it is usually referred to as Indo-Saracenic style. We will hear much more about it from uh, the Nawab, who is not only from the uh, family um, of Rampur, but he is actually a trained architect with degrees from Chandigarh and uh, Columbia University. So I'm really very excited to have this, you know, perfect combination. And Rampur is also known for fabulous jewels. It basically, um, you know, apart from the Kohinoor, Rampur is known as one of the most precious, as a place of one of the most precious jewels in, in history. So maybe we can hear a little bit about this, maybe even something about the theft of, and, and the vault. Uh, of course, you know, we love scandals and things like that, but maybe we can also combine the scandals <laughs> and these kind of, you know, the crooked timber of humankind with some of the more other thematic approaches. And, you know, having given this away, I would like to explore this um, cultural encounter between East and West. And I'd like to explore and provocatively ask, is this domination or is this a sign of uh, innovation in the arts? What is it really? And we hear a lot about this, um, in, particularly in the Western media. And I have the strong feeling and from talking to the families in India, that the narrative is very different there from, what, from the narrative in academia. How can you reconcile this? What is a historical fact and what is speculation? Because when we talk about the motivation of the architecture behind a building, it is speculation. It's not really, it goes away from kind of scholarship. So where is the borderline between the scholarly historical approach? And we have a, a, hist a historian today here as well. And it is now used as a library. Here we have the Rampur Hound. Uh, it is also known for embroidery, this whole uh, Avadi culture, the cuisine, storytelling, um, theater, dancing. It has a fascinating story. We'll hear more about it uh, later. So this is the question that I would like to provocatively ask. Maybe we can keep it in the background throughout this um, event. Is it willful distortion? misunderstanding or artistic innovation. In 1934, your ancestor went to Vienna and I know where he stayed. He stayed in this Grand Hotel and um, as you know, coincident wants it, I lived about 10 kilometers from there in a beautiful palace that used to belong to the imperial family of Austria and Empress Sissi's um, um, bedroom was my drawing room. Actually, <laughs> when some Austrian aristocrats visited Rampur um, in um, the, uh, what was it, early 20th century, the Nawab was fully informed about all the gossip in Austria. And he asked them about the Empress mistress and everybody <laughs> was, <laughs> didn't know what to answer. These things were known in Rampur. And this is really interesting to see how things travel. So when your ancestor, um, this is Nawab um, uh, Raza, Raza Ali Khan. Ali Khan. Raza Ali Khan. Yes. yes. He arrived, it was duly noticed also in the press. Everything was noticed. His clothes, how many people came with him, even his luggage. And to be honest, we know he traveled with 270 pieces of trunks. Goodness me, I don't know what he did with all of this in Austria. But they were also, and, and there was this kind of legendary um, notion. He, they actually called him a duke. They called him a Maharaja, Nava, but they referred to him as a duke, which is the highest title that the European aristocracy has. And um, they said, European wealth is nothing to this duke of India. His wealth is legendary. And um, uh, it is a fairy tale. And so this kind of idea of a fairy tale is a very old story. And of course, it started a long time ago when European travelers came to India, explorers came to India, traders came to India. And what they saw was also just a, a tiny bit 
and they, they couldn't really go inside. Of course, there was the Zenana tradition as well. So there was a lot of speculation and all this fairy tale. And some scholars have argued that that never even went away, both to Europeans and to Indians. This kind of glamour is still associated with the royal families of India, their palaces, their lifestyle. And I would like to explore this. Here you can actually see, it's not very clear, you can see the, um, the diamond uh, necklace with the famous diamonds, but it's very, very, uh, uh, it's not so clear. Yeah. And the famous crown. And, and they also mentioned, um, which is a nice thing, that he didn't only come there for leisure, but he actually came there because his daughter was very sick. Um, it was, uh, she was two years old at the time and she was suffering from some, uh, some sort of paralysis at the time that was uh, spreading. Yes. Yeah, yes. so they, yes. were, they were trying to get medical help. I don't know the end of the story. Maybe you can tell us how it ended and whether they were able to help her in, in, in Austria. Well, uh, I, so that was his second born and uh, she was uh, his first daughter. Her name was Khurshid Lakabega. And uh, so that was much before even my parents were married. And uh, she, had this, uh, she had this problem with her leg, which I think lasted till the end of, till the time she was alive, until mm -hmm. she died. Mm -hmm. So that problem was then, he must, I probably think that at that time he must have tried going to lots of, um, you know, uh, uh, getting uh, opinions from different doctors yeah. and, I don't know how advanced medical uh, sciences were then at that time, but I guess Europe was the place where, you know, everybody would look into probably Switzerland, Germany, Austria. Yes. So yeah. he must have gone to uh, a few doctors to get their opinion as to how to get that put right. But apparently it was not put right because I remember, you know, as a child, she died in 1967. She passed away in 1967. And I was about seven years old. So I remember vividly, she still walked with a limp. You know, right. that problem was still there. So you see, uh, dear audience, this is the dream of any historian. You read something in the press, you find the source, there you have the air. You can ask him the question how it ended. I mean, it's just a dream. It's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So. I'm reaching a little bit out to explain and I don't want to be too long. Um, but th these are some of the earliest paintings of Indian architecture that Europeans saw. These are very famous aqua tints um, by William and Thomas Daniel. And, um, and they had an impact. Um, and I think they, they created this awareness of, oh, wow, there is uh, this Indian architecture. And, uh, and it's very hard to find one source or opinion and make generalizations, right? This, <laughs> but I saw just many extremely positive remarks about the Taj Mahal as a wonder. And I think it still is a wonder of the world, recognized everywhere. But this notion was already present in the 18th century, that this was a wonder of the world, duly noted um, by everyone. So unfortunately, now when I look at recent scholarship, what I see is, I see one explanation. People try to find a, a motivation for the painter. And as I said, this is the field of speculation. So I'm, uh, and, and also India has this extremely complex uh, narrative and history. If you use only one strain out of the narrative, it is misleading. So basically what they say, oh, this is again, exoticizing India. And I think a lot of it has to do with the reception of Edward Said. I find it a real problem, the uh, reception of Edward Said. Um, but I would say this is the, this is part of a romantic tradition. And I show you one example that has really nothing to do with India, but it's very similar. This is Caspar David Friedrich. And you see the same idea. You see a small group of, uh, of people because they, they said, and I go back quickly, oh, that's not realistic. You know, it was, it was distorted. And it, of course there were more people, um, but you know, it's an artist. He is not a journalist there to record things. He can also, he sees it with his own eyes. And you know, this is actually the interesting part and it worked both ways. Also um, Indian painters, Mughal painters saw European art and saw that copied it or were inspired by it and created something that was new. I find that is innovation. 
So here you see this is about solitude. It is about the expansion of our life, that we are small, that there's something more to life than the banal. It is also about fairy tales, it's about ruins, it's about you know, a, a, an unusual tree in a landscape, and it's about water. Very often you see these scenes with someone sitting there looking at the horizon. And it's more like a meditative genre. So I find um, this is time of the romantic kind of um, um, tradition. But it also had an impact. These kind of uh, um, paintings and the aquatins, uh, which were published in 1810, by the, by the Daniels, um, they had an impact on the architecture. So for instance, this is the famous uh, Brighton Pavilion. Originally, in 1786, it looked like that, neoclassical. A little later, you know, after the publication of Daniel, it looked like that, Mughal. It was um, referred to as a madhouse, as the worst example of the, of, the, of the worst taste. People didn't like it. The queen also didn't like it. She complained that you couldn't really see the sea very well from there. But here's another example of ceasing code, um, Samuel Pepys, who had actually experienced India, and he brought it back to, um, to, um, to, um, to Europe. And I think this is also part of normal human behavior. If you go to any diplomat's house who's lived in different you know, countries, he will bring memories from these countries. I do the same. I've lived in many different countries. I bring memories. So, and I think we have also the history of migration, which is different from colonialism, but some of it um, is not political. This is what I'm saying. Um, here I found, you know, I've been trying very hard to find artworks related to Rampo, and it has been very difficult. Even when I looked at the V&A Metropolitan Museum of Art, I checked many museums, I couldn't find many sources. Um, so this is something from an auction house here that is possibly um, um, Nawab Kalb Ali Khan. Is this the one who, who bred? Nawab Kalb Ali Khan, yes. Yeah. So uh -huh. in fact, there's a little story behind Nawab Kalb Ali Khan. He was a, a, a ruler who used to love traveling. And on one of his visits uh, to Turkey at that time, you know, in Istanbul, he was, uh, he was just walking around in the market and he saw a person selling old books. So when he went through some of the books, he found this manuscript, which of course, uh, you know, the Turks had no idea because as you are aware, Turks were ruling Saudi Arabia for a long time. And when they left, they took everything with them. You know, they emptied out the Kaaba, they took all the Islamic relics and everything with them. And they are there in Istanbul today. So at that time, he found this Quran, which was written by the son-in-law of the Prophet, Imam Ali, the leader of the Shia sect of Muslims. You know, he only wrote two such manuscripts in his lifetime. And this was the complete Quran written by him in the, in the, uh, in the seventh century. He was, and uh, Imam Ali was also the, the only, uh, he was the son-in-law of the Prophet and also his cousin. So he picked this, he bought this manuscript in Istanbul, which is there today in the library, which is the most hmm. priceless and valuable manuscript of our collection of over 22,000 manuscripts. So, I so think, yeah, yeah that, that was, that's something which we owe, you know, greatly to him because he managed to get that manuscript to the Raza library. Fascinating. Of course, to have this library is a, is a unique story in itself. I mean, and the whole collection of books, uh, poetry, also storytelling and, um, and religious uh, writings and uh, miniature paintings. Um, I saw this uh, beautiful ivory writing casket um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Something similar, not the same, is actually uh, at uh, the Isle of Wight Osborne House where Queen Victoria had the Durba Hall built in 1890. And uh, this is now, now we are really approaching you know, in the late 19th century, the architecture of uh, Indusaras uh, scenic uh, architecture. And uh, the um, Nawab of Rampur had given her something like this as a gift. Ah, okay. Okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't find the original, but I will actually ask. I'm really interested in the story also of gift giving and, and, and traveling. And so no, I don't remember this one. I yeah. don't remember yeah. this one at all. And um, so something that I should mention here is that most people who were involved in the construction of so-called Indo-Saracenic architecture were not architects. They were actually engineers. 
and it was this kind of uh, let's say and uh, architects came much later and you will find um, something like this i have a few examples um you know like mayo oh. college and um you have of course the famous um jaipur portfolio by samuel swinton yeah, Delhi college in the world. yes delhi college and so on Later, we have another interesting um, uh, uh, development, which is a Russia Party by Ron, by Sir Edwin Lutyens. But this is very different. He was, um, it's, it's, it's a talk for another uh, uh, lecture, and we will have that um, uh, soon with the uh, um, education officer from Russia Party by Ron. Uh, but here it's a much more modern version with neoclassical elements, and he used some of these elements of the Indo-Saracenic style, but he reduced it. It's a much more minimalist style. He wasn't a modernist architect either. He had a very unique style, a beautiful blend of East and West, and some of, of you know, very practical features such as, let's say, fountains on the roof to cool the building down and so forth. Um, but with this, um, you know, these uh, schools here um, built, I, I come, I would like to hand it over and I'd like to give you this motto of the lecture series. Um, namely, it is called resilience. I can't think of a better word to describe both the owners and the buildings in India, but as resilient. So I'd like to read this, um, um, and unfortunately, somehow, let me see the pictures here. Although suffering and challenge demoralize some human beings, others cope and construct instead. Rather than grinding to a halt, certain people hurdle the obstacles or creatively maneuver around them. They even make something positive out of the negative situation. In the face of crisis, they not only survive, but they also thrive. So uh, this is, um, I just, before we hand over, I have one picture that I want, uh, that I put together. Um, here, this is the uh, dining room, and maybe you can talk, uh, but I wanted to show you the bedroom here. Yes. Have you actually yeah. seen, have you seen the bedroom as we see it here on the photograph? Yes, I have. Was it exactly identical with the placement of the furniture and the objects in there? So, um, so this was, I think, uh, this was my grandfather's bedroom. And uh, the chandeliers, again, the chandelier you can see on the top yeah. uh, right. So that was the style of chandeliers which were used in all the palaces in Rampur. And not only in Rampur, I think most of the other states, because I've seen similar chandeliers in Udaipur as well at the Shiv, uh, Shivnivas palace there. So I think most rulers, uh, there were a few companies which used to customize these chandeliers. So I think most rulers got their chandeliers from, you know, these few companies. So that's why the designs were more or less the same. The bed, of course, is, um, it's, um, I think the idea has been taken from a uh, French bed from one of the chateaus. So if you go to some of the chateaus, you'll find similar beds like this. Mm. So uh, this bed was there. This was my uh, grandfather's uh, bedroom. And uh, yeah, this is, this is the bed. And the, dressing table, the dressing table also on the, on the left-hand side is yeah. similar. So it's a very, it's a very uh, European, the style is very European. Yes. And most so of the rulers, they... They, uh, they were into classical styles. Like I personally, myself, I prefer classical style. I'm not into contemporary stuff at all. Yeah, great. So that's why you see a lot, most of the, the furniture or the glassware or the buildings, they were all with very intricate details. You know, the moldings, the, the detailing was very, very fine. Um, now, um, was this a, a silver bed or metal? What was this? The material of no, this. No, no, this was, this was, this was, I think, uh, it was, a, e, probably it was EPNS. Probably it was EPNS. But I can't make out from this, I can't really make out from this photograph. It has a lot of shine. And so uh, maybe it was not even gold? EPNS. It was more gold, yeah. Yellow, it was, it was more yellow, yeah. Okay, okay. And yeah. what color, what color was the canopy? That was, I think that was velvet. It was kind of uh, probably a, may, could be a maroon, a maroon canopy, mm -hmm. or uh, maybe a, a deeper green. But and I think it was it was it looks more uh, more olive green to me from here. 
Honestly. But I, I, I remember because my parents used to talk about this particular, you know, the bedroom, which was an A block mm. uh, of the palace, yeah. And so, and so and this is, and this yeah. is I think this is not Khazbag Palace. This is in the mm -hmm. this is in the in the fort. This is not in Khazbag Palace. So the, the family moved to Khazbag Palace. I think uh, uh, once the city started growing and they wanted you know to move out of the out of the fort. So that could be in the in the early thirties, mid thirties. They moved so to Khazbag Palace. Before picture, that, they were all staying in the fort. So this, this picture is, I think, of one of the palaces in the fort. Uh, this because is I can make level. out from the style of the doors. Yeah. And then you have the detailing on top of the door and the fireplace. Yeah. I think it could be, uh, yeah, it could be the fort. So I and found even, it on even the, by the flooring. I found it on the British Library page. It said um, Hamid Manzil Palace in uh, 1911. Uh, yeah, can be. Yeah. So, Ahmed Manzil was in the fort. Yes. There were 10 palaces in the fort. There were 10 palaces in the fort. And Hamid Manzil was the main. So I think Hamid Manzil was not really a residential building. It was more for the coronation ceremonies of the ruler and for for the Darbar holding the Darbar and you know the all the other administrative work. So the residential palaces were all around it. Hmm. So this is, I don't, uh, I can't see, I can't see the ceiling, so I can't really make out. But as far as I know, Hamid Manzil was not a residential palace. It was the main coronation, uh, you know, where the Darbar was held and the coronation of the ruler was done. And, you know, when there were heads of states coming, then they were received there, they were... Uh, you know, there were the banquets were held there and things like that. I think it was more for that. I would like to ask you uh, about the stylistic elements and the Durba as well, because um, you know the the whole idea of a Durba hall was uh, used by uh, the British as well, and currently it is interpreted very often again in such a way, one-sided way, that this was used uh, only to as a manifestation of power. Uh, but yeah. uh, you also know that your family also used a Durba hall, even in the modern palace yes. in the nine, in, in the early 20th century. They used yes, there was a Durba hall there as well. Exactly. So I would like to know. So, in, in Queen Victoria, she had a Durba hall installed um, in um, uh, 1890, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, in Osborne House, and she had, you know, there's this wonderful uh, film, and uh, maybe you have seen it, Victoria and Abdul, right? In, uh, so, um, yes. and it seemed that she was just, uh, th th it was just something that she had learned about, and she wanted to have something Indian. I, I don't see how this was kind of political in that particular context. So, how was it used by the uh, by your family, why a Durba Hall, and what about the Durba, Durba Hall? Durba Hall is like, see, you see in democracies today, or you see, um, you know, there's Parliament House. In a democracy, you have a Parliament House, so it was similar to that, you know, where the ruler, the you know, the Prime Minister was in the same position as a ruler there, and he had it, and he had his uh, uh, chief, his chiefs. Of, of, you know, of different departments there and there used to be a, uh, it was basically a more of a decision making body or for, you know, pass, passing some laws and, uh, you know, hearing the public um, uh, complaints and things like that. So it was more for that. It was more or less for that. And in fact, the picture which you showed me earlier um, of Nawab Kalbeli Khan. So Nawab Kalbeli Khan got this title of Farzande Inglesia which meant that he was he sat in queen victoria's lap as a child <laughs> you know so they gave him that title of farzan the english farzan means the the heir mm -hmm. or the uh, of, yeah it's, it's like farzan is a persian word for an heir so an english means of england you know it was like that Hmm. So he got that thing. But the, coming back to the Darbar Hall, I think every princely state had a Darbar Hall in their palaces. Yes. So do you think, was this a conscious tradition of the Mughal Empire or was it just something 
like it's, it's something that was just part of the culture and maybe the British... No, no, why, why Mughal? Even earlier than Mughal empires, a lot of, a lot of uh, monarchies around Europe, even earlier than the Mughal empire, they all had a Darba. The Ottoman empire had a Darba hall. The Roman empire had a Darba hall. The Austro-Hungarian empire had a Darba. These are all dynasties which were even before that. So it, this was a system which was followed by, you know, by all the... Uh, all the successors of the dynasties, you know, it was like that. So do you feel when the British had a Durba hall at Rashtra Party Bhavan, it was more a sense of when in Rome do as a Roman? That was called, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's what I also thought, yeah. Um, right, and um, to come back to the bedroom, so I see these uh, neoclassical elements here, yeah, and you know, if, if we talk about, I don't know when this room was uh, furnished, Uh, this uh, you know, uh -huh. picture is from 1911. So we have, yeah. uh, if it is, if it is. And if that, it, too, that too is an approximate date. It could have been a few years before and it could be a few years later. So it's a very... Right. Basically a 20th century. So we are, we are having a very interesting phenomenon here. Also, if we think of Rashtra Party Bhavan, uh, it is a time when modernism existed already, but we have a yeah. huge neoclassical uh, building. At the same time here, even in the smaller areas, we have certain elements of classicism. And I don't know whether this is uh, actually the, the family of the Nawabs who wanted that, or to what extent the, uh, I don't know, the uh, Mr. Wright. See, see I think India, India being a British uh, colony meant it had a lot of European influence, you know, in every princely state. Yes, for instance, certainly. I remember, for instance, if you see the jewelry, so in Rampur, the jewelry, see, Rampur had the largest collection of Basra pearls in India. Mm -hmm. They were kept in caskets like, like uh, gravel, you know, it was like that. <laughs> There were rows and low, rows of caskets with these Basra pearls. So, and all the jewelry was um, in, um, in platinum, it was in white gold. The setting was all European setting. So whether it was Van Cleef or Naples, whether it was Cartier, whether it was any other company. So all, most of the jewelry was designed by these companies. So it had a very, I think all princely states, barring states in Rajasthan, some of uh, the Rajasthan states or Madhya Pradesh. But other than that, most of the states were had, uh, look at the jewelry collection of Patiala. Mm. It was all, uh, you know, designed by Cartier. So it was like that. So I think the European influence was a lot in every aspect of the of the state. I agree. Be it, uh, uh, be it the building styles, be it the uh, you know, be it the the jewelry or be it the furniture, everything was influenced by by Europe. Right, but to some extent, it is, I see it more as an exposure effect in psychology. The more often you see it, the more you are exposed to it, the more you also use it. Not necessarily as an imposition, because I've heard this argument many times from some scholars who said, oh, it was the British who imposed all of this. But I think, uh, I don't see that this was always someone imposing something. It was just something that was a choice, uh, you know. But um, uh, here, these paintings, I cannot see them very well. Is this Venus here or is this Leda in the Swan? I can't, uh, I can't, uh, I can't recognize. No, I can't. Do you remember? But we have, see, Hamid Manzil had us, had, you know, there's, there's a, the central corridor has uh, marble statues which were carved out of single blocks of marble. There were no joints in it. And they were all uh, uh, statues of the Greek gods and goddesses, you know. Mm. So again, it, it had... <laughs> It had the similar kind of look. Even the Darbar Hall, if you see, there's a picture, I think, which I had sent you. And it's, you know, at the back the, yes. of the Hamid Manzil, there's a picture of the, the... So where the throne was kept, on top of the throne, there was a line which was written in Latin. You know? Yes. What, what did it say? So the, I think that uh, there's a picture... Yes, you know, yes. the first image which you showed of the of the of the Raza library and the and the, in, the in, no no before that here here on the right the first one the first one yeah yeah this one on the right so you see just yeah, yeah the one on the right yes. so you see the uh, you see the throne right in the center mm -hmm. and right on top if you zoom in the writing that's all in Latin it's still there today the oh. the ceiling again was 
uh, designed by a French artist, and it was in why uh, it was in twenty uh, four carat gold leaf, because the more the carat, the soft, softer is the gold. So this was all done in gold leaf, mm -hmm. and the chandeliers, the set of five chandeliers, which you see in the hall, these were the these were ostlers. Ostler was a very uh, was very common on most of the princely states, you know, the chandeliers. So yeah. this was customized, and uh, before putting up these uh, chandeliers, when the building was being constructed, especially the ceiling of this hall, they lifted an elephant through a pulley and made it walk on the on the ceiling to see if there were any cracks, so that it could take the weight of the elephant, and then reinforcement was put accordingly, and then the chandeliers were brought in and then they were hung there. Fascinating. And yeah, that was the thing. So this mm -hmm. again, this was the main darbar hall, and if the columns, of course, the 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 cladding of the columns. This is these are ornamental cladding, but inside you have a solid concrete pillar. Uh -huh, okay. So this the the column, the the surface of the column. These were made of jute and plaster of Paris. You know, it's like that. Yeah, okay. And on top. On top, you can see. I don't know you. Yeah, you can see. There's a first floor where the columns are. The top portion of the column. So that was a passage all along the hall, where which was the zanana, where the ladies used to sit, and they had these netted netted curtains, so they could look down on what was happening. You know, the proceedings of the darbar, everything like that. Great. So here uh, on the other side, the drawing room that looks French. Drawing French. room, yeah. Yeah, that looks French. Um, That's again, yeah, it's totally yeah. the chandeliers and the furniture. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is again in the in the kila. It's in the fort. One of the palaces in the fort. Right. I just and I think when they moved to Khazbak Palace, which was built in the early 30s, then all this furniture came, you know, was taken from there to Khazbak. Brothers, the uh, this is the dining hall and. Especially these chairs, which are, you know, the yeah, uh, the back seat. The two have these lion faces on every oh, yeah. two lion faces on every chair. Right. Yes, I see it. Yeah, yeah. So this was like that, and of course there was a lot of wood carving, and the ceiling was every seal every room had a, a different design. Uh, the ceiling was of a different design. Yes. Also, the style is entirely different. I mean, this uh, yeah, is yeah. no longer yeah. neoclassical here. Yeah. Um, looks kind in of fact, the statue which you see on the extreme right, yeah, yeah. it's there, it's right behind me <laughs> as oh. we talk. It's, oh, I it's, missed it's it. right at the back. Yeah. Oh, great. This is wonderful. We might, I, uh, I look yeah. at in, in detail then. Uh, what happened to all <laughs> the porcelain and everything? The, 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 so, I think we, I think all members of the family got. You know, uh, you know their uh, pieces or their uh, their shares of the crockery and the cutlery. And in fact, uh, Khazbak Palace was again. Uh, we they had uh, the largest set of cutlery, which was for a thousand guests. Yeah. You know, it was all identical for a thousand people. So the the fork, the knife, the glasses. Uh, all the everything was the same, so we had a set of uh, for a thousand people of the cutlery set. And do you remember uh, the silver? Where was it produced? Was it Indian silver or from Europe? German, German silver. German. Yeah, and I think the 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 most of the most of the uh, porcelain and the crockery was all English. It was most of it was English. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I wish I could see some pictures, and maybe if you um, go to if you go to South Audley Street in London, you'll yeah. still. I mean, they're selling a lot of. Uh, you know, they have all these shops, which have um, you know old crockery and you know other things, and they have a lot of uh, crockery from the princely states also there. Mm -hmm. You know, with the different monograms. Oh, interesting. I wanted to ask you about the coat of arms because the coat of yeah. arms is something that is also foreign. And I, yeah. I, I found yeah. a, a book once where it was an Englishman. He, he just liked coats of arms and he created yes. them for all the princely states. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so it's all written, uh, the top line and the bottom line, that's all in Persian. 
Persianized Urdu. So Rampur state, the of official language was Persianized Urdu. It was, it had more Persian in it than Hindi, you know. Hmm. So this is all in Persianized Urdu, which I can't really read. Hmm. But uh, every Muslim princely state, they were, in their monogram, there was always a fish. You know, the, the yeah. because fish, yeah. yeah, fish is in most of the Muslim states have got this fish. Because fish symbolizes fertility. Means lots of airs, <laughs> you know. So it was a it was a good um, it was a good um, uh, motive to have in the coat of arms. Mm. So most of the you know we had this, and of course the lions are there, and the two swords um, holding the crown on top. Mm. Um, it was the official this was the official monogram of the of the ruler. And there were two other coat of arms. One was uh, the fish and crown, uh, which had like these two fish and the crown on top. And that was used by all the members of the, of the family, like the sisters and the cousins and, you know, of the, of the ruler's family, extended family. And there was another coat of arm, which had, which had the letter R and there was a crown on top. Mm. So that was used by the ruler's immediate family. Right. And um, so, so when there were these three coats of arms. Yeah. When were they introduced these coats of arms? I think so. The coat of arms. Uh, this one, as since childhood, I remember this one, and this must have been there right from. Um, I think the uh, fourth or fifth Nawab from Nawab Kalbeli Khan's time. And I, probably it was different before that. But I always, we remember this one because most of the, the frames, the silver frames or the, of the plates or the bowls and the teacups and everything has got uh, this coat of arms. Right. Um, I would now like to hand it over to um, Dr. Han to, <laughs> we were already in, to uh, give us a little historical overview and then we go all the way to, um, uh, to the Nawab again. Yes. So. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for this opportunity. And what to add after Nawab Sahib has given this very personal inside experience of history which I think historians can only hope to capture. Uh, we, of course, rely on the archival material that is available. So there are limitations to what one can get there. But so in this brief presentation, what I think I can do uh, is to talk about three movements and three houses, considering that you're interested in houses. And how might historian look at these three houses uh, to talk about three different moments of history and ways of ruling, yeah? So here is a map of the princely India under British rule. And you'll see Rampur as a tiny little uh, orange piece in the United yes, Provinces. yeah, I see that. Which is now the- Which the is the state. current district. So the state became the current district as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so although a tiny dot in the United Provinces and compared to Hyderabad and Bhopal, smaller in size, Rampur is quite remarkable in terms of its... But it might be a tiny dot, but it was a 15-gun salute state. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So <laughs> even though the size in that sense does not explain its immense... Yeah, it's the revenue it. they generated, yeah. Exactly. Because of the historic, you know, fertile yeah, region yeah. of the Rohil Khand and the Tarai. So that's a longer history that I suppose we can't go today. But I want to quickly, perhaps just for the sake of the audience, say that the Rampur state came is a successor to a whole set of other little formation, uh, estates, fiefdom of the Rohillas that were already quite important, uh, of which Aundla, Bareilly, uh, variety of other places, Najibabad, are, are, are a very complex and interesting history, which yes, now, yes. you know, is being written about by a younger scholar. Yes. It has been previously worked upon too, but I think it's it's getting its due attention now. So, but my exactly. work my work is sort of more focused on post eighteen fifty seven when the Rampur state sort of comes into more prominence partly because 
the other than Mughal state is gone. Yeah. So in United Provinces, Rampur survives as the sole Muslim princely state. And that sort of, so 1857, although turbulent time, is actually a good time for Rampur. It really becomes. Because Abad declined, Abad finished after the yeah. mutiny, you know, from Abad, everything, everybody moved to Rampur. So that's how it became more yeah. prominent. Yeah. So 1857 has a very interesting exactly. moment in Rampur history. Yeah. So, of course, it started in 1774 after the Anglo Rohila War mm -hmm. and Nawab Fazullah Khan, in that sense, as the first Nawab of Rampur, in that sense, in terms of exactly. post Rohila War. Yeah? Exactly. So, but. Post 1857, of course, Nawab Yusuf Ali Khan was in charge. But in my opinion, Nawab Kalbi Ali Khan, in a sense, marks a very important moment. Exactly. Yeah. Because he did something very interesting post 1857. And here is a miniature representation of the young Kalbi Ali. Yes. He started something very interesting, which was a fair, a festival fair in Rampur, mm -hmm. known as Jashni Bay Nazir. And this would happen in Bagh Bay Nazir. And there, there, I believe there was this wonderful monument uh, or a house or a kothi, as it would be called. Benazir, Benazir, there were twin palaces of, mm -hmm. there were twin palaces. Benazir was one and Badre Munir was the other. That's right. Yeah. Which are both sort of written poetically exactly. in this man, manuscript from yeah. which you see this uh, visual representation. And it's also been, uh, there is a beautiful verse describing it. So, so there is a both visual and a poetic archive around it. And it was commissioned and it's one of the rarest and uh, arguably the last Rekhti poem, Mosadda. So uh, hopefully this would, uh, we are translating this and hopefully this would see the day in English. Right. But it has been published in Urdu by the work of the Rampurasa Library. And I encourage yes. people to yes. pay more attention to such text. All right. So this is one moment in Rampur's history, and this is the monumentalization of it, the Koti Benazi, which was an idea of the Nawab as somebody who would provide for different sections of the society. The festival around it is very interesting. You know, in India nowadays, literary festival, food festivals are considered the trend of the day. Yeah. But I always joke around the fact that Rampur <laughs> had it own much more interesting festivals. But do you know, all uh, the Dr. Wrote. Khan, what you just mentioned regarding, sorry, yeah. regarding the Nawab's contribution for the different sections of society, I must add that Rampur was the only Muslim state yeah. in India, in British India, where the coronation of the ruler was done by a Brahmin and not by a Mufti, Imam or a Qazi. We were the only Muslim state. And yes. every member of the royal family had a Janam Patri. Exactly. So Janam Patris are not Islamic, but the custom, it was a custom which is followed even today. Yes. So that, yes. shows, that shows the secular nature of the ruler and of the state, which was a very important aspect in a, in a country which was so diverse in religions and castes and, you know, in different social fabrics. Thank you so much for saying that because, you know, the point of these history is, so my book is called Minority Past for a reason, which is to talk about these minor histories which are hidden yes. because the assumption is it's a Muslim princely state. So they, they can't, can be only this particular end of history. And, you know, yes. the Rohini trend and the Brampur it, in the current time is a very political charged area. We know the political situation particularly in terms of the Muslim population there. But this kind of history where, you know, this was a festival attended by all kinds of people, all kinds of musicians. In fact, in fact, my grandfather was the last Nawab of Rampur, Nawab Raza Ali Khan. Hmm. He, were, he used to compose music himself and all his compositions were in Sanskrit. Yeah. I mean, that is something which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to, it was all Sanskritized Hindi, which he used in all his compositions. Yes. So, be it him, be it his father or his grandfather, this is a custom which has been there in our family from a, from, from, from a long time. And it continues even to this day. That is, that is something which you don't find, unfortunately, you don't find in, in, India, in India anywhere, you know? Yeah. Because uh, uh, seeing the current political situation, 
it's a, it's a totally different ball game today yeah yeah and if i can add something that uh, secularism in that time may not be a constitutional value enshrined in the modern then, sense yeah, exactly but, exactly but it is in fact far more interesting because the nawabs of course one of the biggest and the greatest collection of whether it's ragmala painting or sanskritized yes. manuscript of ram and, and the ramayan valmiki's exactly. ramayan yes. which was translated in in persian which yes. were containing over 250 miniature paintings in gold which yes. is there in the library even today this is yes. very interesting for me to hear because as a scholar of european history and who only recently discovered india as a as a scholarly field um this is comparable with the enlightenment in in in, in europe and um, you know if you think of the 18th century in europe uh, i'm thinking of the castle schwetzingen with uh, with a ruler who built a, a mosque and the mosque had no purpose it only had the purpose to show the peaceful um, and um, equality of all the religions so in this mosque you have some um, um, catholic aspects you have um, some jewish inscriptions and some arabic inscriptions just as a beautiful moment to celebrate the equality between the religions and of course lessing nathan the wise and you know uh, the ring parable and all of this so it's interesting that this kind of coincides in a way with um, what is happening in india coexist coexist <laughs> okay so keeping the the limitation of time let me now quickly move to a second moment uh, in our process history which is of course the reign of nawab hamid ali khan uh, yes which is legendary for a different kind of a cultural artifact so if nawab kalbe ali khan was known for his piety and his book collection he was also a very famous patron of poets yeah so the poetry i have a chapter in the book which looks at poetic archive so whether it's his patronage of poets or his own writing his hajj nama actually is a versified persian account an extremely rare and a beautiful text that deserves far more attention than it has received so far so if post 1857 the cultural artifact that ram put promoted in a very strong and very important way was poetry and manuscript around that Nawab Hamid Ali Khan turned to a different kind of cultural artifact although this is something he also inherited previously this is of course music yeah now music is something that he was legendarily known for not just because of the artists that he accumulated in his darbar hall but also of the other building um, in the article that i published i have sort of written about it there's another building in the fort complex that nawab sahab was talking about it's known as the rang mahal Uh, yes, which, which that was my the... father's birthplace. My oh. father was born at the Rang Mahal, and he oh. lived there as a child. Yeah. So if you are now lucky, and as I was, you can actually live there as a guest of the Rampur as a library, and I have. Or be the director of the library. <laughs> exactly, which is a very strange idea of a royal house because it's a huge room that you're given something that. So modern that was not. it was it was a palace i mean in the current uh, context it is it is a palace but it was a, a smaller structure yeah and it was a nursery it was basic my father's nursery you know yeah. he had his governesses he had his staff right and he used that to, it was just him there and yeah. uh, his sisters used to stay in the which was called machi bhavan which is, which is now place. has yeah which has now two girls colleges mm-hmm. of 10000 students i mean it was such a that was the main zanana that it was like a fortress it's a mini fortress itself yeah. so that is that is what uh, all the children of of the ruler were had these little small palaces all around the hamid manzil and it was nawab hamid ali khan who built the hamid manzil that's why exactly. it was called after him yes so that's a good moment to turn to the building itself the hamid manzil uh, yeah. which is, which is in that sense monumentalized among many other construction work that he commissioned i think this building in that sense and its name carries uh, nawab hamid ali khan's legacy the darbar hall and the patronage tradition around it in that sense is also quite interesting and the the fact that it the rampur rasa library is now there is also quite a suitable homage because of course the rampur rasa library collects has one of the most interesting collection on music too um exactly. i must add i must add that when there's a lot of talk about 
the Hindustani music and its communalization, uh, Hamid Ali Khan, in fact, was the start of these nationalizing trust of with, uh, you know, music colleges like Bhatkande and Palushka. They had it was to... called it was yeah. called the Rampur Saswan Gharana. That's right. The reason That's... being Rampur was, uh, of course, Nawab Hamid Ali Khan, and mm -hmm. his his brother got these uh, certain lands in Saswan, which is in district Padayu today. That's but right. that was his brother as well. So that's why it was called the Rampur Saswan Gharana. That's right, of course. And there's a fascinating history to be written there uh, yeah. in terms of the music history. But I must yeah. add here that uh, the, the collection and the mu particularly of music was so important that all these musicologists from Mah Maharashtra had to come there in order for yes. them to come up with their ragathuri theory because yeah. they couldn't do it. They just didn't have those resources. It was and the singers started. and the singers. Absolutely. Jaddan Bai used to Jaddan Bai yeah. used to sing in the Rampur Darbar. That is uh, Nargis's mother. She used That's to sing right. in the Rampur Darbar, and she had. I mean, she was my grandfather's favorite. <laughs> so when yeah. Sunil Dutt and Nargis got married in Bombay, he were, went specially to Bombay to attend the Nikah ceremony, and he was one of the witnesses on in the Nikah Nama, which I saw myself with the CM, and he showed me the Nikah Nama, and my grandfather's signatures were there. So, you know, these were the stories which were there at that time, and uh, it's, it's sad that very few people know about it, you know. Not anymore after this book. <laughs> so in, in a way, what I and Nawab are probably are having is what in music history is called Jugal Bandi. What I know, Absolutely. what he can add is very interesting. So I can give the historical account, but what he has is this lived, inherited mm -hmm. sense of history. It is what, so I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Because and, the, the, and, the, and the famous Char Beth, the Rohela, Rohela oh, tra trademark, you can call it, the Char Beth, which exists even today, only yeah. in Rampur in India, you know. Exactly. So it is, I mean, we can go at length talking about it, but let me now quickly move to the third and the last uh, moment in this kind of history in the colonial period. Nawab Raza Ali Khan, of course, the son and successor of Nawab Hamid Ali Khan. Now, his period, although marks continuity, is also remarkably different from his father's rule because of his interest in modernization. And by modernization, I in here mean a modernization. Education. Yes. Yeah. And education. Yeah. Exactly. So this comes, of course, within the colonial discourse about princely modernity or modern princely state, which meant variety of sphere, education being very important. Uh, industri and industry. And industry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Industrialization. Two important yes. things that he sort of encouraged. Um, and I think the monuments that he sort of built, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad story, but Rampur was one of the most industrialized city I think yes. after Kanpur, it was the second yeah. largest industrial district of UP. Exactly. You know, Raza Textile, Raza Bulan Sugar Mills, the yeah. uh, Rampur Distillery, the, yeah. you know, paper mills. I yeah. mean, there were so many, there was so much industry. There was no unemployment in Rampur at the yeah. time when the state merged. Yeah. So that, that for architectural historian, therefore, then that architecture symbolizes literally the rule, yeah, in terms of its modern aesthetic. So mm -hmm. I think that that's, that would be a, a wonderful project for architect historians to sort of pursue. But in terms of his house, you have the Khasbak Palace. Yes. And here Nawab Sahib can also add, but what I was very interested in was in terms of its emphasis on being a modern place. So as you may know, it was... No, no, one so of what you see in the picture right now, yeah. so Khazbaz Palace has got four blocks. Right. So this particular was the first block that was constructed when right. Khazbaz, when the palace was being constructed. This mm. was the first block. And if you see the four different blocks architecturally, mm. it is just one building, but they are all architecturally, the styles are different of all the four blocks. The elevations right. are totally different. So this yes. was B block. This was B block, the porch of the main uh, palace, which was B block. And later, once the entire palace was completed, 
when the heads of state used to come to call on the on the nawab yeah. they were received at in the porch of this block so this was the main uh, uh block which was used for official functions and ceremonies as right. well you know that's right so what i think you see here apart from a certain less or mentalized but remarkable in its own way is also this emphasis on modern technology yes. so if i'm not wrong khasbag palace was the first fully air conditioned palace centrally air conditioned building exactly. in india exactly yeah. exactly so, so and the air conditioning is still too. there sorry <laughs> great what about the indoor pool was it in the kasbag palace pardon the indoor heated pool the yeah we have the hindu swimming pool was the largest indoor pool of india mm -hmm. the largest indoor pool of india and it's uh, it's still there uh, uh it of course is not being used it's kind of uh, it's been um, you know just neglected quite a lot so there was a there was a there was a civil case which was going on so for 56 years this building was under a lot of uh, you know wear and tear and you know, there was you know nothing was taken care of it so that uh, partition suit that civil suit was finally decided uh, last year and we were the first royal family uh, where this uh, judgment came in the chief justice's court and after our judgment every principal state is using that judgment as a reference for success succession so immediately after rampur it was faridkot royal family after faridkot it was udaipur royal family and that is how it's happened it's happened hmm. Hmm. yeah so i think i'll just stop at that because you know there's i'm sure there are many questions waiting many, for many many what's up yes <laughs> so we should give audience the chance here yeah. and i'm sure they have their own stories too so thank you and thank you uh, uh, thank you both of you i think it's a really wonderful combination between the family insight and 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 the scholarly study really fantastic i'd like to hand it over now to the um, to the audience um, because i really would like to give you this uh, opportunity uh, to have the conversation um from it are we able to unmute some of the audiences if you uh, uh, if you want to make a comment or so you can and otherwise please use the chat to uh, write your question there was one earlier let me just find this <laughs> philip hello so nice to see you again <laughs> i was thinking of you when i heard the um um paris plaster um um the plaster of paris um passage <laughs> wonderful yes really fascinating there was uh, one question hold on um next time i say please um, you know for comment write a c for question a q i forgot it this time um there seem to be a lot of chat messages i can yes. see yes um i'm just looking through mm -hmm. can you ask about the history of the initiation of the rampur princely state uh, uh is that question to me covered it kind of yeah okay Later. so yeah, but, so yeah. basically so basically uh, our family are yusuf zai pathans who originated from kandahar in afghanistan and the head the head of the yusuf zai pathans he had two sons so the they were basically traders at that time and their route was through frontier through the through almora mountains and to bareilly that was generally their route of trading so the younger son kaisar khan stayed back in frontier and the older son daud khan came to bareilly at that time the the peshwas the marathas were created a lot of problems for the moguls so the mogul emperors they took services you know of the yusuf zai pathans and the first battle between the yusuf zai pathans the rohila pathans and the peshwas was fought in a place called fatehganj which is between rampur and bareilly and that battle was uh, basically the beginning of the of the you know the uh, the prominence of the royal apatans as the peshwas were defeated and were pushed right south till uh, gwalior in lieu of this uh, of the victory and the services the moguls gave the present eight districts of uh, western up to daud khan 
and that was called Rohelkan and the capital, the first capital of the Rohelas was Aula. Hmm. Now, Daud Khan's son, Ali Muhammad Khan, he was the one who really, you know, uh, he was very uh, brave and used to fight a lot of battles. And he had apparently eight sons. So the second son was Fezullah Khan, who got Rampur's district. So every stay, every son got, was gifted one district of the pre, of present uh, Uttar Pradesh. And, Ra, and Rampur was given to Fezullah Khan. So I am a descendant of Fezullah Khan. So that is how this history of Rampur started. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Philip Gutches um, about um, uh, the architect, actually. In, in this case, it wasn't an architect. Um, it was an engineer uh, called Wright, right, who built um, the Hamid Manzil Palace. I, uh, so and, yeah. It was basically uh, the entire fort. So Hamid Manzil Palace was, in the, of course, the most prominent building of the fort, which had about 10 palaces around it. And uh, the, the architect was an English architect called Wright. So I'm forgetting the first name, but Sir something Wright. And his statue, uh, his statue, uh, Sir W.C. Wright. And his statue is still there. He's the one, he was the architect who designed the, the fort complex as well as the uh, palace buildings individually. What do we know about his life? Um, I mean, because I couldn't find anything. Uh, no, I don't, I'm afraid not. No. Yeah, nothing. No. I couldn't even find a picture of him. But if we could have a photo of his statue, his statue that would be there, great. You know, yes, his statue sitting on a horse. You know, it's still there. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to see a picture. That would be really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, is there actually ever a painting of the Rampur Hound from the 19th century? I've never seen an artwork of the Rampur Hound. So there's a, there's a photograph which I sent you, yes. and of course there was a you know um, there were four prominent breeds of Indian dogs, and uh, the government of India, the Philatelic Bureau, in the the Ministry of Philatelics in uh, the government of India, they released a series of four postage stamps in 2005, and Rampur Hound was featured as one of those uh, breeds, famous yes. breeds. But artworks and Rampur what Hound is still bred today in Rampur, not by us. Our family doesn't do it, but it's still bred by two or three families in Rampur. And in fact, the CISF, which is, um, you know, the, the for, which is the uh, police force, they still, in, uh, since they are in charge of all the airports of India, they have taken on the Rampur hounds as one of their uh, breeds uh, for, you know, for the airport security. Uh, yes, of course, um, we have an interesting question here. What is the state of the fort and the palace? Is it being maintained as a tourist attraction? As so, we know, it so was I'll, I'll up must, in the yeah. 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 So yeah. what happened was that, you know, once when the British left, all rulers were sovereign rulers. They didn't ah. opt either for India or Pakistan mm -hmm. in 1947. And they had their own judiciary, judiciary, they had their own laws, they had their own chief ministers, they had their own independent autonomous system of administration. But, uh, you know, uh, you must know this, that when before Gandhiji died, he had made a verbal will that upon his death and after his cremation, his ashes should, would not be submerged in the water. Because he wanted India and Pakistan to become one country again which of course was not going to happen. So the ashes were kept at Rajkhat in Delhi. But in May 1949, Rampur was the first princely state to cede to the Union of India. And in lieu of that, Pandit Jawal Nal Nehru was the Prime Minister of India at that time. He bought half those ashes to Rampur because we were the first princely states to accede. And they are still kept in Rampur today. There's a the monument called Gandhi Samadhi where they are kept. So the only two places in the world where uh, the father of the nation is ashes are Delhi and Rampur. Mm. Um, and is... at the time, at the time of accession, all the state properties, when the merger agreement was signed, all the state properties, the government of India took. So the fort and uh, nine palaces of the fort were taken by the government of India. The family retained one, which was a religious uh, building called the Imam Bara. You know, it was the Mardana Imam Bara. That was retained by the family. But other than that, everything was 
taken by the government. But the three palaces, like the Khazbag, Benazir, Badre Muni, the twin palaces of Benazir and Badre Muni, and a Shabat castle, which was a miniature of the Windsor Castle, that was kept, that was private property, which was retained by the ruler. And of course, my grandfather uh, made a trust. So, you know, our family had this collection of uh, rare manuscripts, uh, 20, over 22,000 and over seven and a half thousand paintings. So that was a trust made called the Rampur Raza Library after my grandfather, Nawab Raza Ali Khan, since he was the one, he was the ruler at that time and he acceded the state to India. So that uh, became part of the Rampur Raza Library Trust. With the paintings, I'm really interested. Is there an inventory of the paintings? Because I'd love to know who are the painters because they looked European to me. Yeah, so, uh, well, yes, Douglas Adams was one of the painters. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, I think uh, C.P. Ganguly, there was a British, uh, there was a Bengali painter. He was one of them. And I don't know about the others. Mm -hmm. um, then but these are all canvases. These are all canvases done by them. So they are still kept in the library, the paintings? Some of the paintings and most of them are in miniature paintings. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, probably 15th, 16th century, 17th century, but not earlier than that. Is there a plan to digitize the library? It's been digitalized. It's been digitalized. Okay. The whole collection, the entire collection is on digital system. Yeah. Really? But it's not available yes. publicly? Well, uh, I don't know about that, whether it's available publicly, but you can apply for it and you'll get a digitalized oh, copy. Right. Okay. In fact, when Prime Minister Modi, when he visited Iran, yeah. so for the first time he became Prime Minister of India and his first visit to Iran as Prime Minister, he took only two, he only took two gifts for the President of Iran. And both were from the Rampur Raza Library. One was a digital copy of the Quran of 7th century written by Imam Ali. And the second was Balmiki's Ramayan, which was in Persian, in Persian. Both the digital copies, he presented those to the president of Iran. Right. Uh, a few more questions now about the, heir, the heirloom piece. What is your favorite piece? Um, and what is the story behind the favorite piece, uh, your heirloom? <laughs> <laughs> my favorite piece is my grandmother's crown. Uh, you know, that was, that's a very, um, uh, it's a, it's a very symbolic and that used to be her favorite uh, jewelry piece as well. And in fact, you know, it's so ironical that today in today's times and India, you know, keeps condemning, well, I don't know about uh, presently, but earlier the governments before they all were anti-royalty and there was a debate and, you know, that, you know, you cannot use your, the name Nawab and you can't use Raja and you can't use Maharaja and you cannot, you know, things like that. It was, uh, you know, this uh, topic had come up, but uh, all, I mean, the, not only India, but Indian serials, Indian movies, Pakistani serials, you know, they are using uh, pictures of the Indian royals as part of their props and as part of their scripts. And, you know, even on the menu card, they have pictures of my grand, of my aunt and of the Maharaj of Patiala and things like that. So I think uh, the people today, even today, are, are enamored by Indian princely state and Indian royalty. You know, it's like that. And I think um, that is something which uh, no political system can take away from anybody. Right. Our heritage is our heritage, which nobody can steal. Um, finally, a last question. It's about the people who worked and built the palace. There was an English um, engineer, but um, the people who built it, they were all Indians. All local. Yeah, all locally from Rampur and from Lucknow. I mean, from Mawad, from, uh, from Rajasthan, because uh, there was a lot of labor coming from there mm -hmm. uh, for construction purposes. So they do, were from you still, do you still have a living kind of tradition of crafts and, and, and builders and artisans in, in Rampur? So calligraphy is something which is still very, uh, uh, very uh, famous. The Rampu calligraphy, of course. Um, then we have embroidery, which is a, uh, a small scale industry, which employs a lot of people. So that is very famous. The top designers of India, you know, Tarun Telyani or Rohit Bal and all the, um, all the, uh, the, uh, the people who do the embroidery are from, from our region. They're all from here.
Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so um, I'd like to conclude. Um, there are still so many questions, but we have to come to an end. I'm really grateful for sharing the time. Thank you. Thank you. Eid and before Eid is such a special moment. And I Thank think it's you really and to all of you and to all the viewers and to all your families. A very, very happy Eid. Unfortunately, because of the lockdown, you know, we'll be celebrating Eid at home. But uh, there's nothing uh, more valuable than life. So I guess that's the best thing to do. Yes. Thank you very much for everything. And we are so glad that we could have such a wonderful insight into the history you. of Lampo and, and, and your family. Okay. And Bye -bye. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Germany. Thank you. And please get in touch and, you know, uh, our audience, please tweet about this event, share heirlooms and share some images to keep the history of, um, of Rampo alive, you know, share some of the pictures and so on and look up some of the places and, you know, there are beautiful images um, uh, of uh, the palaces in Rampo uh, on, uh, available on the British Library website um, and they are digitized, you can see them. So please explore it more. And you can always visit Rampur. Visit Rampur. Yes. <laughs> and I hear, I hear from the Nawab, the, the palace will be developed. Yes. So in the future, we will be able to visit and stay there and rediscover it and bring the history back to life. Maybe, why don't you redo the, the festival again? I love that idea of the festival. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. For that. Yeah. You know, we are business uh, oriented at the Center for Historic Houses. So that, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope this conversation will be the beginning of that then. All right yeah. then. Have a nice evening then. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.